Good evening. We got a lot of announcements tonight, so I grab that Snickers bar, sit down, sit tight. No. Okay, on our, our prayer list, uh, we have several. Walter Padon, who's a former member of West Connect, fell. I don't know if he fell. He has a broken femur and is in uh, Orange Park Medical Center, room 268, and we do not have any additional information. Justin Byerly, son of Seal Byerly, is in the hospital at Altamont Springs with a gall, gallbladder issues. Family requests uh, uh, prayers. Justin and his family just moved to Orlando this last week, so they probably don't need that. Pat G Cagle is now home following a recent hospitalization for dialysis. The Kester family, uh, uh, keep the Kester family in our prayer for recent passing of our sister Mary Kester. Faye McCurdy will be going, undergoing blood tests this week for her liver. Danny McCurdy, the great nephew of Bruce and Faye McCurdy, was recently involved in a motorcycle accident. He required multiple surgeries, and his wife is expecting soon. James Simmer, a friend and co-worker of Bruce McCurdy, recently passed away. Uh, please could uh, refer to the bulletin and uh, for uh, all those others that are on our prayer list. Upcoming events, a memorial service for Connie Kersey, the mother of Debbie Danger, will be this Saturday here at the building. The visitations is at 12.30 p.m. with services at 1 p.m. The will group at the Life Care Centers will be this Saturday. Times and locations will be found on the, in, in the bulletin board. Christian Lights, Kids for Christ, and Snack will be this upcoming Sunday. Monday night for the Masters will be this Monday, coming Monday night at 6 p.m. A senior dinner will be next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Please sign up at the senior, a Seniors Bulletin Board if you plan to attend. The annual hot dog cookout will be Saturday, April 27th at the home of Linda Meadows. The new care group lists are ready and available at the front desk. And that's all announcements I have. Please make sure to silence our our cell phones. Good evening. Please mark in your songbooks number 382. Number 382. That'll be your song of encouragement. Once you've marked that, please turn to number 495. Number 495. Of the death and the riches of God's saving grace, flowing down from the cross for me.
Over a month ago now, March Madness started. Raise your hand if you've heard of or watched March Madness this year. I guess that most of you would have known it or watched it. So for those who have not watched or know of March Madness, it is a 64-team college basketball tournament that happens once a year in the month of March. The top 64 teams make it, and the special thing about it, it's a one-and-done tournament. The NBA Finals and the NBA Playoffs is a seven-game series, but March Madness is just one and done. So you could play the best season of your ever. You could play the best season of your college's ever, basically. And then if you have one single bad game, then your season's over. All that hard work is gone. But if you have a bad team and you're like a 14th seat by chance as an NC State, if you win just a couple games straight, you can make it to the final four. But Kentucky was a three seed. They had a great season. They were projected to, by a lot of people to win it all. They had one bad game, and their season was over. But in God's plan, in our lives, when we're under God's security, there's no one and done. We do not have to worry about that at all. So when we have God, there's nothing to worry about. Let's look at a couple verses that prove this. In John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all right, unrighteousness. So at the end of this verse, it says, It will forgive us from our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So no matter what, God is always willing and will always forgive us when we repent. And then let's look at Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. We need to remember what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He shed his blood for us. So we could do two things. So we can be forgiven of our sins, and so we can have a chance to go to God in heaven. So when we look at some people in the Bible, for example, Paul, he was Saul and he persecuted Christians. He was the perfect example of what we shouldn't do in our Christian lives. So today, if you need to be baptized or you just want prayer from the church, we will always be here for you and so will God. So let's come now as together we stand and as we sing.
Shall we pray? Holy Father, we're so grateful to you for this and other opportunity we have to come here and study from your word and sing songs of praise to you. We're so thankful for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and for the hope we have of everlasting life that comes only through him. We thank you for the forgiveness that you give us if we confess our sins and the fact you forget our transgressions. Thank you for this time that we have to be together and this time of fellowship and study. We pray that we'll open our hearts and our minds to the truths that we hear and look for opportunities to apply it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. It's, it's just so weird getting used to not flexing. It's, it's awful. So if I look stiff and look like a pirate while I'm up here, uh, for the next four weeks I have this silly boot on. So for those of you that kind of passively heard Sunday night me say something about my ankle hurting and, and things of that nature, um, I learned the value of the statement that we teach our kids in baseball. If you catch the ball, it won't hurt you. Uh, because, in fact, when you don't catch the ball, it does hurt you. So, it's not broke, it's just bruised, uh, which I'm sort of, the, the elders aren't surprised. I'm usually bleeding or broke or something from somewhere. Uh, so much so that I walked in the kitchen one day after cutting my hand, and Steve and Lori were in there and said, what'd you do now? And I said, ah, just call me Grace. Uh, but yeah, so, if I look uncomfortable and hobbling around, it's this silly boot. I understand how Aiden Farber felt for a really long time, so I'm good to go. So, this evening we're going to continue to talk about this, this whole realm of emotions, this whole emotional pain, struggle, the, the, the trip through all these wonderful emotions that God gave us. Tonight we're going to focus on the damage that comes from not removing the emotional pain and not dealing with the emotional pain process. So, before we get too deep into that, come on, work with me, there we go. So just as, a, as a, a point of reminder, this is what our pain cycle looks like. Um, as we progress through this class and go to the God's Healing Process class that we're teaching on Sunday mornings, we replace this pain cycle and overlay this pain cycle with a grace event cycle on how to process pain and turn pain events into grace events. So to take that painful event and find the blessings, the opportunities, the wisdom, the ability to grow, the ability to make it something that will continue to further the kingdom, something that that you can grow as a Christian, you can grow as a person, that you start to expect success when you have these, these pain events, when you put them in the light of 
of your faith. You put them in the light of Scripture. So starting at the top, you start with your pain event, rumination. Again, that image of a cow where you stand and just chew your cud. It has a purpose for them, but not for a human. So you stand and think about it continually to where it occupies your thoughts, it occupies your dreams, it occupies everything that you do. It causes stress, it causes depression, it progresses through a decision that you've made to get away from it. So some of the ways we escape from all of this are uh, commonly used. First off is anger. That's the most common way we do this. Um, we get angry, then we start running our mouth as a, as a second escape behavior. Another way that uh, we didn't get to touch on was using the me, the me, me, me focus achievements. Right? You have a pain event. You've ruminated about it. You're stressed about it. You're a little bit depressed. You need to get out of that pain cycle. So you do something that you're really, really, really good at that you know somebody's going to give you an attaboy for, and you start patting yourself on the back. Right? And you'll notice there's a common thread with all of the emotional problem and all the emotional pain stuff we're going to talk about. When you get into that cycle, where does the focus go once you're in it? Self. Self. There's a reason why they call it self-control. Right? There's a reason why they call it self-indulgence. There's a reason why we look at this from the emotional pain perspective as you. Right? Love your God with all your heart, soul, everything that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you don't love you, how do you love your neighbor? How do you love God? How, how are you effective in your Christian walk, right? So, attention-seeking. Um, believe it or not, compulsive cleaning is another common escape behavior. Why? Why do you think? Occupying your time. It's distracting you. It's tangible. Gives you a temporary purpose. Okay. Yes. Yes. So carries a lot of, of, of being able to... Um, there's an old movie called Bruce Almighty. And they mop the whole floor. And he says, when, you, we clean, when we finish mopping this floor, everything will be fixed. Right? It's symbolic of cleaning up the mess. Whatever mess you're in, you, it's tangible. Human beings are very tangible creatures. We, we like to touch and feel, and we like things to be right in front of us. We, we want to be able to touch it and fix it and prove it. That's why men are really, really terrible at this. Right? If I can't break it <laughs> or intimidate it <laughs> or make it disappear, it's tough for me to deal with. Uh, emotions are, are, are tough to handle. But compulsive cleaning... Um, that's where we get, this is also where we get into the collecting things, holding on to things. You get into the hoarding situations where you don't want to let things go because you can control it. A lot of these things are about me and me control. Um, road rage driving, poor entertainment, um, living in a fantasy world and fantasizing, burying yourself in the internet, burying yourself in your phone, sleeping consistently, burying yourself in television, and then work, finally, essentially working yourself to death, to, to bury yourself in something that you're good at, something that you can control, something you can hold on to. Because if I don't, if I don't pay attention to the pain event, if I don't pay attention to what's going on, it's not there, right? It's the, it's the funnies in the movies. If you, don't, if, you, if, you don't see, if you don't move, the T-Rex can't see you, right? If I, if I don't look at it, it's just not there. So the other thing that it takes you away from when you bury yourself in self and you bury yourself in these things, you backfill your time that Dennis talked about. When you look at your day and you look at your week, you start backfilling your time with useless stuff. You stop backfilling your time with time in scripture. You stop backfilling your time with prayer. You stop filling your time with a personal relationship with God. It starts to kind of pollute the water a little bit. So as a pain processor, when we work through this emotional pain stuff, first off, recognizing the emotional pain we're recognizing that you had a pain event. Creating a favorable condition. This is that halt stuff. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You got to get rid of all four of them. And if, you ha if you're stuck in it, if you're elbow deep in it, and you can't make a favorable condition, you're not ready to process the emotional pain that's happened. 
but you can process enough to get out of the situation to then essentially make put it in a Tupperware container with no lid and put it on the shelf until you can get to a spot where you can handle it. Maintain an attitude of positivity and humility, right? Putting others' needs before yourself without totally giving up your needs. And then accurate thinking, active listening, and assertiveness. So God's truth is, is the truth. Active listening, truly engaging in listening to people. This is the one we talk about that kind of hurts people. There are two forms of listening. There's hearing and there's listening. When you hear, you've opened your ears and all you're doing is processing information in and out to make a response. You're, you have turned on the prefrontal cortex of your brain and you are ready for the fight or flight. You are processing information in to decide whether or not you have to immediately run or kill it. That's where you're at. Your logic, your reasoning, your ability to flesh this out and slow down has been shut off when you're hearing. You're just looking to make a response to whether, on whether or not you have to defend yourself. When you actively listen to someone, you actively change your body language, right? It's not one of these, right? This, this boot's cool because I can lean like this and hang out like a kickstand. It's not, this is very closed. Don't get me wrong, I've had people say, well, but I get cold. I, I get it. <laughs> I totally understand. But closing yourself off, a closed off body language, not addressing the person, not taking the time to stop, put your phone down, to look them in the eye. Look at the, look at the middle of their nose. You don't have to try and look at each eye. Look right at the bridge of their nose when you're talking to them. It makes people uncomfortable when you stare at them for a minute and give them eye contact. <laughs> but look at them. Sit comfortably. Take a breath yourself before you put yourself into a position where you can actively listen. If there's something going on that's going to disrupt that, then we're not in a favorable condition to do this in the first place, right? So actively engaging the other person. All of this is actionable. That's the other thing. It's all something you have to do. It's not a passive operation. It's work. I know, it's a terrible thing to say. But it's work. But here's the, here's the other thing. So you're walking in your faith. Right? So is, your, so is your ability to work to understand Scripture, to work to understand God, to work to bring people to this wonderful joy and opportunity we have. And then assertiveness, assertiveness is not aggressiveness. Right? Dennis kind of touched on it a little bit. Aggressive conversations, aggressive statements, aggressive communication has its place. If someone is crossing the street and there is a car coming, aggressive conversation is, hey, look out. Or, hey, you need to move. Right? It's a life or death situation. Sometimes in public safety, we had to have aggressive conversations. Hey, we got to go. Hey, you need to do this. Hey, get over here. Whatever it may be. Or aggressive patience, right? Hey, sit down. Aggressive conversations are sometimes necessary, but being aggressive and having aggressive conversations is not the same as being assertive. It's not the same as getting your needs met. It's forcing the need to be met. The other is passive conversation, where you sit back and you just kind of let things happen. Well, I just pull, I turtle up, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Here I am in my little shell. You can be as mean to me as you want. I don't have needs, I'm, I'm good, right? We talk about humility, putting others' needs before yourself. Humility and being totally passive are two different things. Being passive is a doormat. Everybody walks on you. Everybody gets what they want. You go the extra mile to make sure that they get what they want and you never have a need met. You just let it happen. The other is passive aggressive. I call these folks the keyboard heroes. The people that behind a keyboard, behind a phone, behind a computer, somewhere away from people, they're the meanest people in the world. If I was face to face with you, there's no telling what I would do. Okay. Well, come on. You feeling froggy? Uh, I really didn't mean it. I'm sorry. 
right? That's the passive nature. When they get confronted, they back up. They become that passive person. But these are the people that are the, <clears throat> the, the do things just in spite of you kind of folks. And then lastly is the assertive nature. The we need to talk about this. These are my needs. What are your needs? Right? The people that have the most trouble with this are the passive folks. Because they don't even know what their needs are to be met. Because they're so used to putting themselves in a different place. And they're so used to getting walked on that they don't pay attention to what they need. But this is the assertive nature is, these are my needs. Now I'm going to actively listen to you about what you need so we can work together and make this happen collectively, right? Because the pain event for you may also be a pain event for that other person. Your active communication, your active listening, your assertive nature, this group discussion, this collective, may be helping them more than you realize. So, come on, clicker. These transitions all look really good in my office, and they sound like a really good idea until you put them up here. So, clear, accurate thinking, active, true listening. These are the lists of the re a review of the common escape behaviors that we go through. These are very broad. They get de super detailed into sub sections of all of that, but the first two, the reason that they're in the order that they're in is those are the immediate first two that the vast majority of people go to. When they have an issue, when you have an issue, you have a painful event, the first thing that happens is we get angry. And it may be angry at you. You might be angry at yourself. It's not out, not necessarily outward anger at the, other, at the other person. You may be mad at you. You may just start beating up on you. Self-deprecation, when you're angry at yourself, is still anger. It's just aimed towards me. So verbalization, again, like I mentioned a few weeks ago, this is the, I don't mean to talk bad about that person, but, right, that nasty but that nullifies everything before it. With all due respect, uh, there ain't respect coming, I promise. And then moving on to especially things like food. Food problems are a control issue. Uh, most of the rest of that is a temporary a temporary release of dopamine into the brain or serotonin into the brain to cause you some sort of, of temporary relief. But it's all temporary, right? That's what all of this is. All of this is fleeting. All of it. There's nothing up here that lasts for eternity. None of it. And when you focus on me, and I focus on myself, and I focus on my problems in the I, 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 I of all of this, that's all temporary. I am temporary. Right? It's a lot to think about. I'm, I am guaranteed, this is the, the hardest thing in the world if you really think about it. We keep telling everybody, you only get one day, right? You live life one day at a time. And you get one moment. You get one moment. You take one moment at a time. You one choice at a time. That's it. Every day is qualitative, not quantitative. You make one choice at a time. You work through one process. You're guaranteed just over six seconds because every it's, it's one breath every six seconds for 12 breaths a minute. That's it. You don't know if you're going to get the next one. Huh. Right? Wouldn't that be wild, standing up here teaching a class and then boop, because I don't know if I'm going to get the next breath. So the reality is all of this is temporary. So we turn, we talk about these classes, and we talk about all of this stuff because this is what it causes damage to. The third bubble up there is where the temporary ceases and the eternal picks up. Right? So we often talk about in this class, 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. I was sitting in a room now full of our brothers, right? How many of our brethren are experiencing these types of things? God gave all of us emotions. It's awesome. He put a bunch of imperfect, broken people in the world and said, here, go work together. And I love every bit of it. 
I think it's fantastic. And then we manage emotions, and I manage my emotions, and I manage my life in a circle, in a sphere that I often look at as only being mine. But if you look at everybody as having their own little sphere around them, as I get close enough, right, my sphere interacts with everybody around me. So paying attention to what's going on, paying attention to yourself, being aware that self-care is not self-indulgence, we work to avoid damage to this. What you think is how you feel, how you feel is how you act. So damage to your thought process. Right? When we talk about damage to your thought process, statements like, I'm unworthy, I'm not good enough, I'm the worst person in the world, if people knew the real me, they wouldn't love me. Anybody ever made statements like that? I'm not good enough. Right? I'm unworthy. I don't deserve any of this. No, you don't. But, right? Shortcoming statements. I won't be able to get my needs met if I depend on some. If I depend on others to meet them, this behavior is my greatest need. And lastly, the most painful one, God can't meet my needs. Right? The first section, the first few statements are all I statements. Me. And the one thing I'll say, get out of God's way, first off. Second off, when you mess up your thinking, you damage that thinking by using these escape behaviors, right? That's why it's all circle. It all works together. You start getting all these, these angry thoughts. You start the gossip, the run in your mouth, the foul language, all of that stuff. Right? I've worked with people that used to use four-letter words like a comma. And then you ask them about personal things. You start talking about their day. You think about the runs we made, the things that they were exposed to, the length of their career. And you realize that they've escaped away from all of the pain that they've been through. They don't process any of it because... What's well, a common statement of public safety and the military alike? It's my job. It's just my job. Somebody's got to do it. Right? I love my wife to death. She would kick me in my bad ankle if she heard me say this. My wife's been in pediatrics her entire career. That's what she does. She's flown on helicopters and ridden on ambulances, and she works in pediatric surgery now. I love kids. I don't love when they're sick, <laughs> right? I'll take care of one. As a paramedic, I'll do my job. I dehumanize the patient. I do what I have to do, and then I cry about it after the fact. My wife has held a small child's heart in her hand doing manual compressions to keep a baby alive. She can tell you what the kids look like. She can tell you what their names are. She can tell you everything about the situation. And I said, we need to talk about this. You need to process this. And the first thing that came out of my wife's mouth was, it's my job. Somebody has to do it. Right? That big old garbage bag we talked about, dragging that thing along, just kicking on down the road. The thing we talked about in the grief class on Saturday was a backpack. Right? I look at it as a backpack now. I like the backpack analogy. It works really well. Because backpacks are heavy. What are we doing as Christians? Where are we headed? Simple question. Right? We're headed to an eternity. Is the eternity with God a flat, perfectly smooth, no problems road? If you say yes, I'll call you a liar. It's not at all. It's a climb. It's a journey. So as you carry these pains, as you carry this pain, as you carry this struggle, as you carry all these burdens in that backpack... Right, I walk around with my backpack, and I stand here in front of all of you with my backpack full of problems. And like Dennis mentioned last week, Galatians 6.2 tells us to bear each other's burdens. If I don't, Ryan brought it up, if I don't expose that and talk to you about my burdens and share my burdens with you, how do you know what's in my backpack? If my backpack, garbage bag, bottle of feelings, whatever you want to call it, is closed and completely opaque and you can't see it, and I don't show it to you, how do we make that walk together? While I'm over here struggling, trying to make the next step and grab the next foothold, and don't tell anybody. Right? I, I, I'll say it a thousand times. This place is more like a hospital and less like a country club. This is where you can bear those burdens. This is where you can 
pour your heart and soul out into these folks. This is the family. This is the church. This is the people that love you. This is one of the only places in the world where you can stand up here and you can make a <laughs> complete fool of yourself and promise hot dogs that aren't there <laughs> and, and laugh about it because you know the family loves you. But if you don't know, and if you don't have that friend group, and if you're not willing to have that thought process that this is a family, that these people do love you, that you can build that friend group, right? And I'm not saying every Sunday you got to come forward and say, oh, you know, I got a little aggressive on driving down the road. You can. You're more than welcome to. But to find that friend group and build that core group of people and those people that love you that you can truly open up and pour yourself out to and receive that from them to create a true brotherhood, a true family, that helps bear all of this. That helps your stinking thinking. Right? Your broken thoughts, I promise. You come to me and say, ah, oh, if people knew the real me, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't want me in this building. I'm going to challenge you. We're going to talk. Not just because I'm a counselor, but because I care about you and I love you. Right? That's stinking thinking. Thoughts, feelings, actions. Because here's the trouble. You start to have bad thoughts. Then you start to physically damage yourself. You start to step out into the gambling, the drinking, the smoking, the risky behaviors. Then comes building all of these things up and you start to separate yourself from the body. Right, like we talked about. God put fish in water for a reason. God put plants in the earth for a reason. God built you to be close to him. You separate the fish out of the water, they die. You separate the plants out of the earth, they die. You separate you from God, you die. That's what happens. You develop these bad thoughts that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. Woe is me, Eeyore kind of focus, right? I love Eeyore. I don't know why. I use him all the time. He's my absolute favorite Winnie the Pooh character because I print a big picture and show it to people. Say, I'll help you find your tail, buddy. Here you go. But you get that thought process. You build that in. You build that into the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act. And now Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday morning become an it becomes an obligation. Oh, I have to. You know, people don't see me. One of the elders is going to call me. I don't want them to call me. So I'll show up on Sunday morning and I'll skirt out the door real quick and it'll be fine as long as people see my face. And then it's, oh, I'll sleep in and watch a little streaming this morning. It'll be all right. It's just one Sunday, two, three, four times a month. And then it's, yeah, I'll watch streaming today or, you know what? I think we need to go get out on the boat and beat all them church people to the boat ramp. I say that because I lived in that family. I lived it. I lived it. My dad would say that jokingly. We got to beat all the Baptists to the boat ramp. So we got to get out at 10 o'clock in the morning. I stepped foot in a church when I was with my grandparents, but I didn't know any better. But the thing is, the stinking thinking came, which created more depression and more problems for me down the road which caused me to physically hurt myself, which caused spiritual separation even further until God kicked me in the back of the head and said, hey, fix yourself, and here I stand. But that's why we talk about damage to your thoughts, damage to your physical body, and damage to your spiritual body, and then damage to your habits. All right, habitually, you're in a good spot right now. You're here on a Wednesday night. You could be doing a myriad of other things, or you're watching on live stream on a Wednesday night. You could be doing an, any number of other things, but you're here, you're engaged, you're part of this. You're learning, we're studying, we're growing, right? That's a positive habit to have. When you start talking about not dealing with emotional pain, not dealing with these problems, not working through this difficulty, you start talking about poor thoughts, broke down self, broke down spiritual gui guidance, and then your habits start to fail. And you create new habits much like we see way back in the beginning, right? Moses goes up the mountain. What comes with Aaron? Uh, golden calf. Tangible things. You start filling your life with things that you can feel, things that make you feel whole again. Because God can't help me. He can't meet my needs. I'm not good enough. I've messed up enough 
there's no saving me. I've heard that multiple times. I've made mistakes bad enough that God doesn't even want to talk to me anymore. And we all know how true that is not. That is you in terrible thought process and a painful event that happened that you didn't deal with. The cool part is, each painful event has its own cycle. So if you haven't been dealing with these for a while, I got time. <laughs> but in reality, that's how this whole process works in Christianity. That's why Dennis pushed the fact, that's why I pushed the fact that this is a God process. This is guarding your heart. This is guarding your mind. Because here's the thing. As a human being, let me ask you this. When we talk about damage, where's your mind? What, what is your mind? Sounds like a stupid question, I know. What is your mind? Most people say it's just this. Right? Most people say it's just your brain. It's not. It's not at all. Your mind involves all of this. Right? Not to go too far away into the realm of big, big weird terms. So much so that God created your body, perfectly created your body, to send out what are called afferent and efferent signals. It sends a signal from your brain out to your fingertips. When you grab something that's hot, it hits that, sends a signal back to your brain. Your brain says, hey, let go, silly. That's hot. Right? Your mind, your thought process, even involves your guts. Anybody ever heard the statement, garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, we talk about that a lot with eating. You eat garbage, you feel like garbage. If you eat candy and sugar and all kinds of chocolate, you feel real good for a little while. The more you eat it, as long as you keep eating it, it gives you that temporary satisfaction and everything's good. And then when you're like me, when you've eaten the whole cake, you're like, oh, man. And here comes the stinking thinking. It's not good anymore. Right? Your guts, your guts help the way that your brain functions. You eat good, healthy things, not just exercise. That's why they always pair it as diet and exercise. Right? It's not a diet. It's an eating, it's an eating way. You eat clean, you eat healthy, you feel better. You have more, more energy, more emotional control, more physical control. You're able to take care of yourself, right? Self-care is not self-indulgence. You're not damaging yourself. So your mind, your body has a mind that traverses everything from head to toe. Everything moves for a reason. Everything has a purpose. That's why there was pain in my ankle for the past three or four days. My body says, hey, something's wrong. Right? And my mind eventually said, I want to get that looked at. To which I responded, you don't know what you're talking about. So, <laughs> and I went and got it looked at anyway. But the reality is your mind, your function, the way God made you is perfect. 21% oxygen is what's around you right now. 21%. Actually, in this room, it's probably 20.9. Right? Why is it not 100? You don't need it. You can't, you can't breathe 100% oxygen. It doesn't work that way. We can, we can put 100% oxygen on you. It washes out your lungs. It causes you to get sick. Crazy, right? 21% oxygen. It's perfect. It's perfect for the human being. God made you perfectly. And the coolest part is... We get to watch ourselves mess it up. So the reality is, when you talk about your mind, you talk about your feelings, you talk about your thoughts, thoughts, feelings, actions, anybody ever have those thoughts? And I still get them. Right before you're going to do public speaking, right before you're going to do something new, where your stomach gets upset a little bit? Yeah, right? You don't think about it anymore. It's happened so many times. So much so that before coaching a baseball game, I don't eat. And I'm just coaching eight-year-olds, right? I couldn't imagine the high school coaches. I wouldn't eat for a week. <laughs> I don't eat before a baseball game. My stomach gets upset. It, it all, it's all connected, right? So when you start thinking poorly, you start eating poorly. You stop taking care of yourself. You stop sleeping. You start to create physical damage. If you're not sleeping, how much time when you can catch up on sleep? You ever notice you can't ever catch up on sleep? 
Never. Never. You can sleep for 14 straight hours, and you're still going to wake up tired. But you're always going to be chasing that fix. You're always going to be chasing something to make you feel better. You're always going to be working towards some way to fix the emotional problem. So this is why, right? This is the why. Why do we talk about this? Why do we bring this to the auditorium? Why do we keep beating you over the head with it? Because it hurts your walk. It hurts your trip to heaven. And I'll also raise this. Hurt people hurt people. Right? When I was hurting... When I was coming off the fire line and I was going home after watching death, destruction, and mayhem for 24 hours, I was short-tempered, I was exhausted, I was mean, I was passive-aggressive. You put a box out there and I'll check it in a negative way. Because I was, I was hurt. I just watched Lord knows what happened that day. Right? And we joke and I... I joked before, if you can't get arrested for it, they call the fire department. I'm serious. It happens all over the country. We did everything. And there's no telling what I saw. But I took it out on my family because I wasn't able to process it. I didn't have the emotional intelligence. I didn't have this. I didn't have this thought process to say, hey, you need to get this stuff out of that bag. You need to fix this. We need to work through it. First and foremost, go to God in prayer, right? We got to talk, God. I got problems and I can't, I, I can't sort this out. And I'm telling you, having tried to do this by myself before, if you've never tried this by yourself, please don't. Please don't. I speak from experience. Do not try this by yourself. You cannot do anything by yourself. It is a walk with you and God. And if you think you can do it by yourself, I will sit and talk to you till you're tired of hearing me speak about how poorly it is going to go for you. It doesn't work. You separate yourself from God, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, first and foremost, put yourself in God. Put yourself in that thought process. Put yourself in Scripture when you first wake up. Put yourself in Scripture and in prayer when you're stuck. Things may not be this bad, where you're at a physical damage point, where you're at a thought damage point, where you're at a spiritual damage point, but it may just be a bad day. The thing I will raise you is let's not let it be a bad day. We say that all the time. Well, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, it's just going to be a bad day. No, it's not. It's going to be a bad 10 minutes. Why am I giving up the whole day? Right? Could you imagine any time anybody went to battle? Any time anybody went to battle. They lost troops. They got pushed back a little bit, and they're like, well, pack it in, boys. War's over. Why give up the fight for 10 minutes? Right? You woke up, your water heater's bad. You got a cold shower. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry. It's a bad day. It's a bad morning. It's not a bad day. We're not giving up the whole fight. It's like that's, it's the snowball effect. Once it starts rolling down the hill, you're standing right behind it just kicking it on down there. And you're standing back watching it saying, man, why does this snowball keep getting bigger? It just keeps getting worse, and I can't figure out why. Don't give up the fight. Give up the 10 minutes. Give up a little ground. Step back. Put yourself in the presence of a God that can do anything. Anything. And here's the hardest part about the whole conversation. What are you doing when you put yourself in that position that God takes control. You're surrendering. Uh oh. I don't want to let go. I don't want to let this balloon go. I don't want to let God do it. I want to hold on to just a little bit of it because I can do this. I can work through this. I got it. You're surrendering. You're not giving up, right? You're not just laying down to die to quit. That's not what I'm getting at. When you walk with God and you stop and talk to God and you say, God, I need help. Let's do this together. You're acknowledging and understanding that God is the Alpha and the Omega. God is all 
things. Much stronger than you are. And he's, he can also be your best friend. Right? Just like our kids. Just like all of these little kids. Help me. Right? How crazy is that to say? The greatest picture in the world that I, ha- that I have seen, and I really want to frame it, hang it from the wall in my office, it says, Dear God, with tears, love me. Sometimes that's what you need. Sometimes you just need to pour your heart out to him and say, help, I can't do this by myself. I did, I've been there. So when we talk about this, this struggle, we talk about emotional pain, we talk about, I, I frequently in this class talk about Proverbs 4, 23 through 27, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech, put this divisive talk from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all of your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. And then 2 John 1, 8, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Right? Sometimes you've got to give up a little ground. Sometimes when you have that bad 10 minutes in the morning, you've got to give up a little ground. You've got to give up a step. It's bad 10 minutes. I've got to reframe my mind. I've got to stop this. But the reality is when you look at things, to me, when you look at things like 2 John 1, 8, to look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, right? I'm not giving up the fight. I'm not giving up the war. I'm not stepping in to bad habits and bad thoughts and, and being a broken self, I'm giving up self. I'm giving up looking at me. I'm giving in to to God, right? We've made progress. You've made progress in your spiritual walk. You've made progress in your maturity just as a in the human realm, in a, in a secular worldly realm. You've matured, right? You've learned. You've developed knowledge, you've developed wisdom. You've learned a lot of what not to do. The hard way. I know, I know a lot of you. <laughs> We've all learned a lot of things the hard way. Contrary to what my parents tried to teach me, I still learned the hard way. But it's always a continual work forward. Right? We talk about it in the grief class all the time. We don't really mention it in this emotional pain class, and I wish we would mention it more. We don't ever move on. Right? We move forward. Moving on is totally forgetting the knowledge and wisdom you've learned from the past. People say, ah, just move on. Sure, let me get right on that. If I could do that, I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be upset about it in the first place. But the reality is it's a move forward. Because if you hunt for the blessings, the opportunities, and the wisdom from the interactions that you have in life, from these emotional pain events, from these struggles, from the good times, from the bad times, from all of it. You look for blessings, opportunities, and wisdom to carry with you, you're moving forward. Just like when we talk about the 10 on the pain scale, the loss of a loved one. When you lose a loved one, that is is an absolute hard 10. But you're never going to forget about that person. That person is never going to leave your life. They're physically not here. So when we talk about those things, we don't ever say we're moving on. Because I'm not moving on from that loved one. I'm not moving on from that person that I poured. We poured life into each other. I'm taking them forward with me. Life will continue, but their love, their wisdom, their knowledge, the things they gave will continue with us as well. The same way as working through these emotional pain events. When we talk about processing these pain events, we talk about taking that pain event, creating a favorable condition, getting rid of all the halt criteria, sitting down and working through this, you're moving on from that pain event in a way. You're truly just moving forward. Your next step is just forward. Do the next right That's it. That's all we're looking for. Sit down, stop, think about it, move forward. 
with the event. Take that knowledge, take that wisdom, and the greatest part is, whether it comes to grief, whether it comes to pain events, whether it comes to the grace events, however you want to look at this, the pinnacle of pain processing, the pinnacle of your grief process, the pinnacle of all of it is when you're able to take that experience, take that growth, take that knowledge, take the, all of that stuff you've learned and use it to help somebody else. When you can teach this, see one, do one, teach one, right? When you can teach this process to someone else, you can sit down and have a conversation with someone and say, hey, I can help you process this. We can work together on this. I see you're hurting. Let's do this. Let's sit through this, right? Because no, no two people are the same. We all have different experiences. But a little bit of experience that you had, a little bit of knowledge that you gained, a little bit of wisdom that you gained may help someone else exponentially. It may help them more than you ever realize. And it may not help them today. They may think about it two or three days from now. And it'll hit them, and they're not even going to remember where it came from. They're not. But it'll help them more than you realize. So the reason we talk about this, the reason we push this issue, the reason that we're, we're here is because in the end, this is what it causes damage to when we don't do these things. And the biggest struggle that we have, the biggest thing that we want to avoid is we want to avoid the spiritual separation point of this. Right? You can be physically damaged. You can have bad thoughts. You can have bad habits. We can turn away and turn around all of those things. Those are temporary things. We can bring that back. We can stop those things from happening. We can work through all of it. And I say we because, again, it's you, God, and the church, and those people that you're close to. But spiritual separation is where the struggle starts. Because, again, Six seconds at a time. I take a breath once every six seconds, roughly about 12 times a minute. And that's my guarantee. Beyond that, I got nothing. And the reality is life's temporary problems, much like the, some of these lower end emotional pains, are temporary. They're temporary. So we work through this process. We talk about this process. We put this all out in front of everybody because we don't want your temporary to become permanent and create a spiritual separation that causes a permanent problem, an eternal problem, right? That's, that's, where, that's where this becomes a big deal is because we don't want it to get to that point. We want to fix it while it's still temporary. So problems, comments, questions, or concerns? I know I didn't give you all a ton of time. Kind of long-winded tonight. All right. We'll close in prayer, and we'll let you have the evening. Father God, we just thank you for another wonderful opportunity to be together. We thank you for this fellowship opportunity we've been given. We thank you for the breath of life we were provided today. and We just thank you for the emotions. And Father, we praise you for the process that you've given us to, to handle those emotions, to work through these painful events that we have in life together. And Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've been given to share this life with those around us. Father, we, we just thank you for for your comfort, for your joy, for your guidance. And Father, we pray that you be with everyone here, that you guide, guard, and direct us, and that we turn to, we're able to turn to you when we struggle, and we're able to help those around about us turn to you, that they may continue on in this path in life, that we may continue that race to an eternity. Father, we just thank you for each and every moment we've been given. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.